Dick Barnett is kind of the forgotten great player on the Nick championship teams. If you think in terms of a winner, a guy who changed the game in a lot of instances, a guy who was before his time, that's Dick Barnett. When I came to the Knicks, he was my idol. He taught me how to cherish the game, uh, tenacious work ethic, teamwork. If you knew basketball, you had to admire him as a player, and he was beautiful to watch. A key cog on the New York Knicks championship teams of the 1970s, guard Dick Barnett was best known for his unorthodox shooting style. The way Dick shoots, you cannot teach. It was the most unbelievable shot. He looks like a fish out of water when he's trying to shoot. And he would kick his legs up in the back and then shoot that jump shot. It was funny at first, you know, just seeing a guy kick because I hadn't seen that before. Like a question mark. Everything was going in a different direction. But there wasn't much question. That ball was going in. As the person was guarding me and as I got my shot off, I would just say too late. Uh, fall back, baby. <laughs> fall back, baby basically meant to the guy that was trying to defend, it's over. The shot's in the air, it's going in, fall back, get back on defense. He was very prolific at, at getting his shot off in all circumstances. I haven't seen anyone else shoot like that uh, over the years, so that was part of what I developed on the courts as I was growing up in Gary, Indiana. Dick Barnett was born in 1936 in Gary, Indiana, a segregated town known primarily for its steel mills. Gary was a industrial city and basically very poor circumstances and you know you're living from day to day. It was very difficult. They had very little. He saw the reality of working say in a steel mill for example and he decided very quickly that uh, he wanted to try to reach beyond that. I proceeded to practice and work on my skills as, a, as an athlete as a means to perhaps uh, go beyond the steel mills. Determined to alter the course of his life, Dick Barnett discovered basketball in the most unusual of ways at a young age. He really never had a basketball. He couldn't afford a basketball. I started playing with a ping pong ball and a tin can and became pretty good at it. And the coaches heard about this at Roosevelt High School and indicated that I might be able to do something with a basketball and a basket. Dick never was a type of person that would really get his grades. His main concern was basketball. I don't even think he had a girlfriend doing high school. <laughs> he spent all this time out there on that court. Dick never went to his prom. He was out on the basketball court shooting them hoops. That's what he did. Dick Barnett became a star player at Theodore Roosevelt High School. And in his senior season, he helped lead his team to their first ever Indiana State Championship game. There, they faced off against another young basketball prodigy, Oscar Robertson, in an historic matchup. Oscar Robertson for the corner. This was the first time that you had two African-American schools playing each other for the state championship. Barnett firing, getting it in there. And you had two of the greatest basketball players in the world at that time in high school playing against each other. Robert, there's one of his favorite spots. Oscar and them started off real fast. They made the first five or 10 points before we even got a score thing. And they kept that pace up. Underneath the round, that's a 20 point lead. Oscar just wore us out, man. They beat us bad. Dick wanted to be as good as Oscar Robinson. The runner-up award. Oscar won, Dick lost, and he's never let that die. The championship award. If it weren't for Oscar Robertson, Dick Barnett might have been considered the best player to come out of the state of Indiana in a couple of decades, in at least a decade. But he's a little bit overshadowed by Oscar Robertson. Despite losing the state championship, Dick Barnett's high school accomplishments did not go unnoticed. Barnett was recruited to then Tennessee A&I by legendary coach John McClendon in 1955. Barnett excelled immediately on the court, but his lifelong disdain for the classroom nearly cut short his athletic career. I didn't understand that academics and athletics could peacefully uh, and productively coexist. Dick was in school and they posted the GPA scores for all the students in school. And one guy had a 3.5, one guy had a 3.2. I says, Dick, what do you have? Dick says, I got 30.0.
That's my basketball scoring average. That's my GPA. Dick Barnett and Coach McLennan had a, a falling out, and Dick didn't want to go to class. And McLennan just said, okay, Dick, you're either going to class or you're going home. While Barnett's academic priorities were in question, there was no debate about his athletic abilities. On the court, he led by example and helped turn the Tennessee a &I team into one of the most feared on the collegiate level. McLennan would close the gym on Sunday. Dick Barnett would break in the gym to play basketball to practice. They won three national championships, unheard of. And in two of those years, Dick was the MVP. He's one of the best college players ever. I'd heard about him when I was in high school in Atlanta, Georgia, and he was a very prolific scorer, so he was like a legendary figure throughout the South. That team was one of the greatest teams in, in the history of college basketball. Tennessee State won three straight national championships, and because of the relationship of race in the South at that particular time, we really didn't get the accolades and exposure that we would have gotten if we had been a white team. To this day, Dick Barnett remains Tennessee State's all-time leading scorer with 3,209 points. In 1959, the NBA came calling when the Syracuse Nationals selected Barnett with the fifth overall pick in the first round of the draft. Here's Dick Barnett with that funny jump shot getting drafted in the NBA. Boy, that was, that was, that was big news in gearing in. I felt good that he had made it. It made me feel good. Mm -hmm. My prayers were being answered. That's what he wanted. Coming out of Tennessee a as the number one draft to us, indicated that dream in America with all of its contradictions really do come true. Dick Barnett could play defense and offense. He could steal the ball. He was a playmaker. He could shoot from the corner. He was a well-rounded basketball player. Dick was a prolific scorer, actually. He relied on a, a one-handed shot, the left-handed shot that was remarkable. We couldn't stop Dick. We could do nothing against him. We played zone. We played man-to-man. -man. We tried to press him. We couldn't. He was just that good. After being drafted by Syracuse in 1959, Barnett spent two seasons with the Nationals before signing with George Steinbrenner's Cleveland Pipers of the ABL. Barnett helped lead the Pipers to the league championship before returning to the NBA the following season with the Los Angeles Lakers. He spent three years out west, but on October 14th, 1965, Barnett's career in Los Angeles came to an end. Fred Schaus, who was the coach, said, you know, to upgrade our team, we need to trade you for Bob Boozer from the New York Knicks. In order to get him from L.A., they gave up somebody very formidable. Boozer was a 6A guy and a very a, a terrific ball player. And a lot of people didn't know about Dick Barnett. People were upset in the garden. Dick Barnett immediately won over any skeptical fans in New York by averaging over 23 points a game during his first season in the Garden. But on February 18, 1967, in his second campaign with the team, Barnett's future nearly came crashing down. Most people are not familiar with a ruptured Achilles tendon, but uh, once that happens, it's like a flat tire. At that time, now we're talking 40 years ago, that was a serious, sometimes career-ending injury. It was a very intimidating and frightening time. What would I do if I'm not able to play professional basketball again? A light bulb, come on. Dick, you got to go back to school. You got to have a second alternative. And this is what he did. Barnett made a miraculous recovery from the ruptured Achilles tendon and returned to the team for the start of the 1967-68 season. But he also kept up his promise to further his educational studies. I began the whole process of going back to school. I started going back to Tennessee and I in the off season, and I decided to go back to school at New York University and acquired a master's degree in public administration. It was hard for me to believe because I knew Dick when he had no interest in education in school or anything. And all of a sudden, you know, he says, Cal, I'm back in graduate school. I said, yeah, right. This is not a Dick Barnett that I know, you know, but, but it was. On the court, Dick Barnett continued to excel. 
after averaging 18 points a game and helping guide the Knicks to their first season over 500 in nine years, Barnett's future once again appeared to be in doubt towards the end of the 1968 season. The Phoenix Suns were coming into the league, and the Knicks could only protect a certain amount of players. And there was a lot of talk about the fact that Barnett, at the age of 31, might be one of the players the Knicks were not going to protect. There's a lot of talk about you maybe being put up for grabs I in the expansion. It, seriously. You think this series kept you in New York for sure? Uh, I don't think it's serious. I think my performance throughout my career keeps me in New York. Suddenly in the playoffs that year, Dick Barnett was the star again. He averaged 24 points a game. And suddenly, no longer was there a question mark about who to keep. They kept Dick Barnett. I was thoroughly prepared to be one of the best players in the league. So they don't move best players uh, at their zenith of their career. So I wasn't even worried about that. I played with the Nationals for a couple of months, and while I was there, Dick and I were roommates. A very, very funny roommate. <laughs> he used to go through the lane, and he used to yell to Wilt, come here and get this big fellow. When he'd go through the lane, uh, taunt Wilt to try and get his uh, running shot. He was a very humorous player to play with. You were remarkable, you son of a gun, with those driving left hands. Just remarkable in getting the arch over a Wilt's head. Well, I've been pretty successful during the series doing this. I see dollar signs up there on the backboard. He was the jokester, the charlatan, <laughs> the trickster. You know, he would bring humor to a situation. Well, there was one next game where they were complaining about some fouls not being called on the on the opposing team. And uh, during a timeout, Dick turned to one of the officials and said, that a dog whistle you got? Only a dog can hear that whistle? When you had a Dick Barnett on a team, everybody was quiet, you know? You just kind of keyed off of him because he'd always say something that would loosen you up or laugh or he'd make fun of you. He was a unique person in that regard. On the court, Barnett and the Knicks were no laughing matter by the time the 1969-70 season rolled around. New York took the league by storm, setting a then-NBA record with 18 consecutive wins during the regular season. Barnett's all-around game played a pivotal role during that stretch. You know, he was good at 16, 17 points every night. What he brought was consistency to that ball club. Very solid defensive player, rarely got credit for that. I was with Baltimore, he was with New York at that time. Defensively, he always played me, so, you know, I, I'm still aching from all those hacks and whatnot on my wrist and whatnot. But he was a great uh, defensive uh, player. After finishing the regular season with a league-best 60 wins, the Knicks rode their magical run into the postseason. New York defeated Earl Monroe's Baltimore Bullets in seven games and then knocked off the Milwaukee Bucks in five setting up a final showdown with Barnett's former Los Angeles Lakers. The team split the first two games, and the series headed to Los Angeles for game three. You always want to get that decisive game, and the Knicks needed that game badly, that third game. Throughout the first 47 minutes, the Knicks and Lakers played a hard-fought game, and with just seconds to go, the score was tied at 100. Eight seconds left to go on the clock. Seven, six, five. The Busher shoots. Hit with three seconds to go. I think it was three seconds or four seconds, whatever left. Wilt takes the ball and throws it to Jerry West, and Jerry comes up the floor. Here comes Jerry. And you know Jerry's nickname is Mr. Clutch, Captain Clutch, because he always makes a clutch shot. In fact, I was in front of Jerry. I got out of his way, and he was so far away from the basket that, hey, let him take the shot. Two seconds, one second. West throws it up. He makes it. He makes it. West makes it. And then, of course, the Los Angeles fans are yelling, the, the Knicks stupefied. Obviously, I thought we would lose, because I said, if we were going to win, God wouldn't allow that shot to go in. What looked like a certain victory now appeared to be a series-changing moment, as a deflated Knicks team gathered by the bench. One player wasn't ready to throw in the towel. Dick Barnett walks over to us and said, said, what's wrong with you guys, man? He said, this game's not over. It just started. We were so close to winning the game. You know, I say, our job isn't completed, and we can still win this game. Here's the most unlikely guy, if you're looking at a spectator, because he's not the let's go away after him type guy. But you gotta listen closely, because what he said always made sense. Just like that, it clicked. You're right, we're playing a five minute game. That's all we gotta do is win a five minute game. Behind Dick Barnett's leadership, the Knicks held off the Lakers 111-108 in overtime to take the decisive third game. 
Days later, after the heroics of Willis Reed, Clyde Frazier, and the rest of the team, the New York Knicks defeated Los Angeles in seven games, giving the franchise and the city their first NBA championship. We have a new NBA champion. It was a great time, and, and the city was very excited. It, it was a very satisfying victory, you know, being a part of that championship team. Dick Barnett's contribution to that team, too often is overlooked, because he was playing with great stars. But ask any basketball fan or any teammate, they'll say, Dick Barnett was a vital, vital part of the whole thing. Three years later, in 1973, the Knicks captured their second NBA title, defeating the Lakers in seven games. For Barnett, the end of his career was approaching, but his veteran presence was very much felt by the team. Dick still had his moments against certain teams coming off the bench. Uh, he could still score. So he was an integral part of the second championship as well. Dick was more of a mentor to all of us, and we knew that whatever he did and whatever he said was going for the betterment of all of us. Those championship teams of 1970 and 1973 are embraced by the city to this day. Um, it's still Camelot for New York fans. Every team is compared to that. Obviously, it has left a indelible mark on the psyche of a number of New Yorkers over the years because I still get uh, stopped in the streets of uh, New York City. People still remember those times and remember those days. Dick Barnett retired from playing in 1973, but he didn't leave the game entirely. Knicks coach Red Holtzman anointed Barnett as an assistant coach. Barnett was always one of Red's favorites, even when he was a player. Red, Red admired and respected him. He lent a, a different perspective to the team. I mean, Dick was still there. He was able to sit back and analyze what we were doing right, what we were doing wrong, and tell us about those things. I stayed in coaching as an assistant coach with the Knicks three years to understand I didn't want to be a coach. <laughs> After completing his master's degree at NYU during his playing years with the Knicks, Barnett set his sights even higher when he enrolled at Fordham University to study for his doctorate degree. I wanted to do that right after I finished my master's, but certain things intervened, and I, I lost about 10 years. I said, well, let me go back to school. I thought he was off his rocker. I really did. He was probably close to 50 years old. Everyone asked, Dick Barnett got his doctorate? Yes, he did. He, he received his doctorate. I thought it was hilarious. They called him Dr. Barnett. <laughs> I said, Dr. Barnett? Where did that come from? Where did he get his license on 42nd Street? <laughs> One of the things that I determined a long time ago, that I'm just as smart as any, anybody else. Dick Barnett also became a published author and poet. He taught sports management for four years at St. John's University. And he currently runs an organization called SportsScope, which is dedicated to the study and research of athletes in American society. Well, life after basketball has been uh, <laughs> quite exciting. He's in a, sort of a class by himself, a professional athlete in one regard, a world champion, and then an educator and an author and someone who writes poetry. You don't find it too often. I'm a Renaissance man, OK? <laughs> On March 10, 1990, the New York Knicks recognized Dick Barnett's athletic achievements by bestowing upon him the ultimate honor, retiring his number 12 to the fabled Garden Rafters. It was a fitting tribute as Barnett's former coach, Red Holtzman, was also honored during the same ceremony. The fact that they did it on a night with Red Holtzman, I think made it even more special because it did show the closeness between those two. Madison Square Garden is the mecca for arenas uh, in sports lure. And obviously, uh, they don't have everybody's jersey that hangs in Madison Square Garden. I never forget that night when that number we going up to the rafter. I went to crying. I was just filled with joy, tears. It was magnificent. That was a, uh, a I don't know what kind of feeling I can, can explain to you. We just, just feel proud all over. That sort of completes a circle because now 
all five starters from that championship team, the 70 team, and now the coach are all up there. And they're all up there together. When my friends here are very elated and uh, happy that my number is being retired. This was a special day, the final recognition that I played a major role in uh, the success of the, of the New York Knicks at, at that particular time. Over a 15-year professional career, Dick Barnett averaged just under 16 points a game and played an integral role on two NBA championship teams. Dr. Barnett has also been inducted into the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, the Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame, and the National Collegiate Hall of Fame. His career is one of remarkable athletic and academic success, a career that sometimes has not gotten the recognition it deserves. Dick was the other guy but he was an instrumental component of the championship years. Dick was really one of the leaders in that team, and I thought that um, he held a big piece of our success in the late 60s to the early 70s. He's one of the architects who built the, the legacy of what the Knicks were about. And no one can really forget that. Dick Barnett was more than number 12 on the court. He was somebody that you idolize in every aspect of life. His legacy has got to be that you don't have to be born with a silver spoon in your mouth to accomplish something in America today. He's been a person who's been driven. He's a good example of, of, of having a dream and pursuing it and, and, and having it come true. Dreams really do come true, whatever it might be. Life is a continuum. Just because I reached this goal doesn't mean that, that I'm through. There are other goals that I'm trying to reach, so there's always something ahead of me. So what now, my brother? <laughs> there's always something else ahead.